to Dr. Robert Wasbaum, a sociologist, leading sociologist of religion at Princeton, had been doing research on short-term uh, missions, and they kept saying, you need to connect, you need to connect. Uh, a couple of years ago, we had a workshop uh, where a number of you were present uh, that Dr. Ruth now helped facilitate uh, for a number of people that are doing research related to short-term missions. You can read in your handout all of the details uh, about Dr. Wathnow. I would just like to highlight again a book that has recently come out, Boundless Faith, The Global Outreach of American Churches, from Dr. Wathnow, uh, published by University of California Press. This is a, a book which is looking at global connectedness. It's looking at short-term missions, among other things. And it's a pretty, uh, pretty strong critique of certain received ways of understanding uh, new, new patterns in terms of the global church. I think it is likely to be stirring up uh, quite a discussion in uh, the theological uh, circles. I love the book. I think it's great. I think everybody in here needs to read a copy. Um, I will go ahead at this time, turn it over to Dr. Watt now. He has his time, and hopefully at the end there will be time for a little bit of interaction. Let's welcome. Thank you, Bob. Uh, thank you all for uh, being here this evening. I um, am delighted to have this opportunity to be here and to speak with you. Coming into the middle of a conference like I am, uh, I'm curious, uh, before I start, to find out who you are, and I'd like to uh, do that rather briefly. Um, how many of you are clergy? Can you hold up your hands? How many of you are seminary students? Okay. Quite a few of you. How many of you, of you are faculty of some kind? How I many of you are social scientists? I may have met <laughs> social scientists. <laughs> a few others. Okay. How many of you have been on a short-term mission trip? Okay. All right. Great. All right. Well, that, that helps me. I am uh, here this evening as a, as a sociologist, not as an expert by any means on short-term missions. So what I want to do is. Uh, put some perspective on the topic, if I can, uh, raise some issues, uh, highlight some uh, that are spelled out in more detail uh, in the book, uh, maybe feature some other things that are not in the book, and then hopefully allow plenty of time for questions and discussion. So over the past five or six years, I've been directing a project, a research project at Princeton University that officially was focusing on the international dimensions of American Christianity. So it covered a wide range of topics, and, and that's why I'm going to hit on a number of topics uh, this evening. In one sense, this was my post-9-11 project uh, because it was inspired by the sense after 9-11 that the world has changed and that the United States needs to be and probably is going to be more directly connected with the rest of the world uh, than it has been in the recent past. In a broader sense, though, this was an opportunity for me, an opportunity really at long last in my career to investigate some issues that had been with me for three decades or so, concerns about the political and economic dynamics of the modern world system and concerns about global inequality, global culture, imperialism, and the role that religion has played in the past and may still be playing in connection with some of those larger themes. Now, in my discipline of sociology, few ideas have gained as much attention in recent years as the topic of globalization. And that's simply because the evidence is unassailable that goods and people and information and other resources 
are flowing across national boundaries more than ever in larger volume and often with greater rapidity. And that's really my definition of globalization, simply the flow of goods, people, information, and other resources across national boundaries. And so having been exposed to that literature in sociology, I was coming into this project, looking at religion, assuming that religion would be connected to the rest of the world, from the United States to the rest of the world, in similar ways. In other words, that there would also be evidence of globalization affecting religion. So I was completely surprised as I started to look at the missiological literature. Not being a missiologist myself, I hadn't looked at that literature more than just in a passing way in the past. And so when I started looking at that literature, and even before when I started talking to clergy or interviewing people who were working in missions departments, but more often just in congregations, people would say, well, there's this new paradigm that's out there. So, well, what is this new paradigm? You have to understand the new paradigm. And the new paradigm, they usually meant the one that had been popularized by Philip Jenkins in his book, The Next Christendom, which everybody had been reading, published in 2003, it's making its rounds in the churches and so forth. Uh, but when you look at that book, by Jenkins' own admission, he's not really trying to tell a new story. He really did kind of see himself as putting together a story that had been out there for a while. And it's there in the work of Andrew Walls, it's there in Samuel Escobar, and a whole variety of other people that Jenkins draws on. And in propositional form, the new paradigm goes something like this. It asserts, for instance, that Christianity on a global scale experienced significant growth during the 20th century, and this growth will continue. That the majority of Christians now live outside of the United States and Western Europe. That's the key assertion. The growth of Christianity in these other parts of the world has been exceptionally strong and will remain strong. This growth is happening primarily through the efforts of indigenous churches, often Pentecostal churches or spirit-filled churches. And so for that reason, the growth of Christianity in the global south is especially vibrant and dynamic. And during this same period, Jenkins and others argue Christianity has weakened in the United States and in Western Europe, so that to the extent that there is some connection between the global north and the global south, it's the global south sending missionaries back to the global north. Well, that's it in brief propositional form. But it's also a story. It's also a narrative. And in order to understand why it's been as attractive as it has been at the kind of grassroots congregational level, you have to understand it as narrative. So let me, let me read it to you as a narrative. It's my version of the narrative, but I think it's accurate uh, in terms of what the new paradigm people are saying. Once upon a time, Indeed, not very long ago, Christendom was located in Europe and the United States. The rest of the world was not Christian and needed to be saved. To save the world, the United States and Europe made heroic efforts for a long time to send missionaries. These efforts, while laudable, never worked quite as well as expected and often caused resentment. Europeans especially were guilty of combining missionary activities with imperialism and colonialism. They kind of exempt America from that problem. It goes on, though, after World War II, many colonies became independent nations with nationalist and even communist regimes, causing doors to be closed to missionaries. All hope seemed gone. But then a surprising thing happened. Once left to themselves, people all over the non-Christian world began to discover Christianity on their own. 
soon Christianity was flourishing everywhere. That is, everywhere except the United States and Europe, where it was declining. As a result, the center of gravity of Christianity was now located in the global south. In those countries, especially Africa and Latin America, evangelical and Pentecostal churches were growing at a furious pace, and a new Christendom was being born. In this new heartland of Christianity, faith was more vibrant, more authentic, and closer to that of the early church than it had been for a long time. In an ironic historical twist, this new Christendom in the global south would probably be the source of hope for the decadent people living in the United States and Europe. It would send them missionaries and challenge their secular assumptions. It might also have to wage war against the historic antagonist of Christianity, especially Islam. Well, this certainly is a new paradigm. As I began to think about it, I couldn't help but think of my aunt, actually my great aunt. Her name was Amanda Cruz, and we called her Aunt Amanda. She, back in the early part of the 1900s, uh, as a single woman, came here to Chicago from Kansas, where she'd been raised, went to Moody Bible Institute for a few months, went off to Nigeria, and spent the next 40 years of her life in Nigeria. She's buried there. And in those days, she had to get permission from her mission board to do almost anything, like put up a wall to keep the rain from pretty much taking the rest of it down the hill whenever the rain came over. So she had to write to her mission board. That took about a month for the letter to get there and about a month for the letter to come back. Maybe by then something else had happened, but that was the extent of communication. And she was the only American, probably the only white person in the part of Nigeria where she was working. She had to walk miles and miles, and then later on, eventually, she bought an old rusty motorcycle and rode it through the bush, but sometimes had to leave it because she couldn't take it across the river to get it. Well, if that's the old paradigm, then the new paradigm certainly does point to major changes. And I sometimes wonder, well, what would Aunt Amanda think about the new paradigm? Would she be surprised? Would she be heartened by what she sees in, in Nigeria? Well, probably. So there is a lot of merit to think about the new paradigm and how things have changed. But here's the problem. As you look at a lot of that literature, or if you look at Jenkins' new, uh, next Christendom book, you don't find any evidence at all that people in the United States are still connecting with the rest of the world. Suddenly that's just dropped out of, of the picture. And there are some reasons for that, which we don't have time to go into. We can talk about later if, if you'd like. Part of it is this kind of post-colonial period that we've been living in for quite a while that kind of says, well, that really was a bad pattern. We're glad we're past that. It's good that indigenous Christians are having their own churches and a lot of those colonial connections have died out. There are also some interesting connections you can make with secularization theories that kind of say, well, yeah, okay, secularization was happening in one part of the world, but it wasn't happening in another part of the world, and so forth. So there are some reasons why it might have been attractive. But the main thing I want to focus on is the fact that we, in a way, need to get beyond that new paradigm and think of a new new paradigm that reconnects the global north with the global south, or especially in our cases, most of our cases probably the United States with the rest of the world. Okay. So what does the evidence show? Now, those of you who may have looked at the book, this will be familiar to you. I'm assuming a lot of you haven't, and if you haven't, don't, because these are the cliff notes. You don't have to. Um, <laughs> so, what the evidence shows is actually that the global outreach 
of churches in the United States is at an all-time high. By every conceivable indicator, international dimensions of Christian outreach have been increasing. Immediately somebody's going to say, yeah, but what about the recent recession and so forth? Yeah, sure, there are those kind of ups and downs. But generally, the trend has been up. Uh, for instance, um, let me be begin by talking about spending, spending by U.S. churches on overseas ministries. Uh, total spending is about $4 billion a year, about $4 billion. It's probably more than that, but you know, some churches don't report their statistics as well as others. But if it's about $4 billion annually, and I think that's a credible figure, that's an increase of almost 50% after inflation over the past decade. If you look at the number of full-time missionaries, people who are serving abroad as full-time missionaries, that number is substantially larger than it was in the 1950s when we all thought that was kind of the high point of missionary activity. Figures collected by some of the major Protestant mission agencies and denominations a few years ago showed that there were nearly 43,000 U.S. citizens working full-time as missionaries in other countries. And that was an increase of about 16% over the previous decade, and significantly higher than in the 1950s. And in addition to that number, there were approximately 65,000 non-U.S. citizens and foreign nationals who were being supported by some U.S.-based mission agency. And then there were 350,000 Americans who were engaged in medium-term mission activities, that is, between two weeks and a year, serving as mission volunteers, 350,000. And then short-term mission trips, we think, have become even more common. I still think that hard evidence is pretty difficult to find, so my best estimate comes from the survey that we did in my project in 2005, national survey of active church members, and from that we estimated that 1.6 million Americans had gone on short-term mission trips in the past year. And that did not include teenagers because a, a survey of that nature starts with people who are 18. So, yeah, probably you did include 18 and 19, but not your 15, 16, 17 year olds. And of course, we have pretty good evidence that there are quite a few teenagers going on these trips as well. Now, if you try to put some further information around that, one estimate uh, that also came from our survey is that the average number of days that those people spent was eight days, and that didn't include travel time. And that meant that in total, there were about 30,000 person years of time being com committed, which was about a fourth as much as the total amount of time by full-time professional missionaries, to put it in perspective. And if you were to put a dollar value on it, and here we used some estimates for volunteer time by independent sector in Washington, we estimated that approximately $1.1 billion uh, was the amount of time that people were volunteering on short-term mission trips. And that didn't count preparation time or travel time. And then, of course, the cost of travel has to be factored in as well, and that varies enormously. So we tried to think of kind of a conservative estimate and say $1,000 a trip. So that would be another $1.6 billion altogether. Now, as soon as you mention figures like that to a journalist, and I got some journalist emailing me from Fort Worth two hours ago, they want to know, is there a trend? And so you say, well, you know, we kind of forgot 20 years ago to ask that question, and so we can't really tell you about trends, but that's, that's what they're interested in 
We do think there's a trend, just from the anecdotal evidence, and we did a lot of qualitative interviews with people in churches and who've gone on trips. One small piece of evidence, if, if you're looking for that kind of evidence, we did ask people, had you ever gone on one of these trips when you were in high school, when, when you were part of a high school youth group? And so that way we could compare those people who'd been in high school in the 80s or even before the 90s and since then, and the trend was definitely on the rise. You looked at it that way. The other thing, though, to say, especially anecdotally, about all of this, and maybe as a research tip, another way to think about it is that, yeah, the volume of activity may be increased, but how new are these trips? How new is the idea? Not very new, I don't think. Here's, here's my anecdote. You can look at the Internal Revenue Service website, irs.gov, and if you look around long enough, you'll find a list of every nonprofit organization in the country because they have to file an IRS 990 form. Churches don't, but a lot of churches do. And you can find the founding date. And you can also find some other things, like if they're large enough and want to report it, their assets, their income, their board of directors, and so forth. Now, I haven't done this systematically, and there's some reasons why the data aren't always that accurate. But one of the things I noticed in looking through this, there's a group called Haiti Love. And I knew from the location that I knew something about it. I grew up in Kansas. I left Kansas in the late 60s. And this group was listed as having started in Kansas in the early 1980s. But I knew it had started before that because about the time I left Kansas, our neighbor, who was a farmer, was going to Haiti on short-term mission trips. His work as a farmer was seasonal. He was a member of a little country Methodist church, Ebenezer Methodist Church, and they started having short-term mission trips to Haiti, and it still exists as Haiti Love. We've been doing some additional interviews since I finished the book in kind of out-of-the-way places like that, small rural churches, and it's pretty amazing. Um, they may not be big enough now to send a full-fledged short-term mission trip, but often somebody's gone on a short-term mission trip, and somebody has in the past. And oftentimes, it did have to do with it being seasonal, seasonal work. Uh, it didn't necessarily have to do with college students or high school students. Sometimes, especially nowadays in small churches, it's the pastor or the priest uh, who's done it. But it's just a kind of cautionary note to kind of remember that some of these things have been around for a while. And as a research project, it might be interesting to use those kind of IRS data to see what could be tracked down. Um, now, since I mentioned this, the survey, um, let me mention a few other ways, besides short-term mission trips, that churches, church members, are involved in international ministries. Uh, we found, for instance, that only one church member in six, and these were active church members, says that his or her congregation is not involved in international ministries in one way or another. Three quarters of church members say their congregations had an offering in the past year to raise money for overseas hunger or relief programs. In more than 80% of those congregations, there's been more than one such offering in the past year. Uh, three quarters of church members say their congregation has supported a missionary in another country in the past year. About half say their congregation has sent a group on a short-term mission trip of some kind. About half say their congregation has hosted a guest speaker from another country in the past year. 
And then there are some other ways, too, that aren't quite as common, but still may be important. For instance, um, about four members in ten say the congregation has a committee that focuses on overseas missions or other international programs. A quarter of church members say the congregation has had a meeting in the past year of which the topic of war or peacemaking was the primary topic. A quarter say their congregation has discussed U.S. policies toward other countries. And one congregation in five has a full-time staff member with special responsibility for overseas or global mission, missions. So quite a bit of activity. Now having mentioned these survey results, um, let me just mention that this was a nationally representative survey. It was conducted among people who said they were church members or had attended church uh, at least once or twice a month. And almost everybody, 95% had. And so that was 41% uh, of the adult public that got screened in, uh, in that way. And it pretty much uh, reflected the denominational distribution that you find in some other surveys, for instance, Christian Smith's national survey from a few years ago uh, very closely parallels that. Uh, we included 2,300, approximately 2,300 people in the sample. As I mentioned, it was done in 2005. We spent more than six months in the field to make sure that we got a good response rate. And response rates are always critical and sometimes not so good in, in these surveys. And in addition to some of the questions I just mentioned, we also asked people about their personal involvement in international ministries. So here are some of the things we found. Three quarters personally said that they had given money in the past year to some international relief or hunger project. Uh, nearly half of church members said they had attended a meeting in the past year at which a missionary or a religious worker from another country was the main speaker. 18% had participated in a church meeting at which war, peace, refugees, or some other international issue was discussed. 20% said they had done volunteer work that was specifically concerned with helping people in another country. And 14% said they had signed a petition or written to a political official about an international issue, trade, debt relief, poverty, and so forth. Now, of course, there are some denominational differences in these, but unlike many surveys that focus on other, maybe more politicized topics, those denominational differences were not very important. Mainline Protestants, Evangelical Protestants, Catholics, historically black churches, were all extensively involved in their own ways in these transnational activities. More than anything else, what mattered was the size of a congregation. Large congregations simply had the ability to do more programming of all kinds, and so were more likely to do international programming. If one then says, all right, what are the marks of the most transcultural congregations? If you had to pick out the top 20%, the top 25% or so, what would distinguish them from other congregations? Well, it seemed to me, and this was as much from our qualitative in-depth interviews as from the survey, that there were four distinguishing characteristics. And these I don't think will surprise any of you. First, a theological emphasis on sharing the gospel globally. So a theological emphasis. Secondly, a missional emphasis at the heart of the congregation's identity. A missional emphasis kind of thing that Daryl Luter and his colleagues write about in a book by that title. Third, an organizational mechanism such as a missions committee or a global outreach director. And then fourth, an intentional leadership strategy, an intentional leadership strategy, one that builds on existing energies and interests and channels those in an appropriate direction for specific projects. Now, as it turns out, congregations are by no means the only ways in which 
American Christians are involved in international activities. So let me turn to some other ones. Centralized boards and agencies, parachurch organizations, are also playing a very important role in linking congregations and individual Christians to other parts of the world. On the missions front, just let me give you a couple of examples. On the missions front, consider the International Mission Board of the Southern Baptist Convention. Any Southern Baptists here? Okay. <laughs> um, its annual budget, not this current year, but a recent annual budget for uh, missions activity uh, was $283 million. $283 million. That supports 5,000 full time foreign missionaries. That's a five fold increase since 1955 for the Southern Baptist Convention. The support staff for those missionaries, the support staff in Richmond, includes 500 people just to support them in, in the field. And the board is also responsible for training and deploying approximately 30,000 short-term volunteers. And through its missionaries and volunteers, then the board claims approximately 600,000 baptisms annually, worldwide, and assists with the work of nearly 100,000 churches overseas. So that's one example. A different example, Campus Crusade for Christ. Its annual budget is approximately $420 million, and about a third of that goes for overseas ministries. And the most visible of those activities, of course, was the Jesus Project. By 2005, after that started in 1979, Campus Crusade estimated that it had distributed 42 million video cassettes, 13 million audio cassettes, and that they had reached almost everybody on the globe, 6 billion people in 105 countries. And they claimed that 200 million decisions for Christ had been made through the Jesus Project. On the relief and development front, World Vision, its overseas aid expenditures back in 2003 were $513 million. And that was an inflation adjusted increase since 1981 of 326%. Catholic Relief Services spent $479 million on overseas projects. And if you total up the, just the top, the largest faith-based relief organizations, they were spending about $2.3 billion a year as of a few years ago. So those are just a few examples. Now, all of this, of course, fits the Christian mandate. And in that respect, shouldn't surprise us. But on the other hand, it is stunning in the extent of activity and in the extent of increase. It is consistent with the Great Commission, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. It is consistent with Acts 1.8 that says, you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. But we don't ordinarily, we kind of being at the grassroots level, not you all, thinking about this for a long time, we in the churches don't still think of the churches as being primarily global emissaries. The churches are still very much local, very much local. And I want to emphasize that for you in a couple of ways. For instance, one of the ways that congregations that are connected with denominations are not local is by sending money to their denomination. But at most, congregations are sending about 5% of their budget to their denomination or to something outside of their congregation. Their biggest costs are clergy salaries, keeping up the building. And those are things that local people are willing to support. We all know, also know from many sociological and anthropological studies that People 
like their congregation because their friends are there, it's close to their home, we know that the average person doesn't commute more than 10 minutes to their congregation, they not only have friends there, but perhaps they feel that they are called to serve in their congregation, so they serve on committees. They contribute to soup kitchens, but the soup kitchens are local. They help the homeless, but the homeless are local. All of those things are good reasons to say, yes, churches are still local rather than global. We'll come back to that in a, in a moment. But we do need to remember that the heavy emphasis is on the local either congregation or the community or the city surrounding that congregation. And I won't belabor that point, but I, I, I do want to suggest that one of the weaknesses in the sociological literature until recently has been that almost all of the questions if surveys are being asked of churchgoers were about those local activities. And occasionally a question would be asked, but it would be so specific it would mention has your congregation participated in a crop walk or have you as a congregate given money through your congregation? Never really ask any questions about missionary activities, let alone short-term missionary activities. So we've also had a kind of blind spot in the sociological research. Well, I want to move on uh, quickly to talk a little bit about the sources of this increased level of activity in international ministries. I mentioned several sources. First of all, international communication. It's really one of the key factors driving the current globalization of American Christianity. Um, without boring you with a lot of details, uh, there are just a lot of indicators that you can put together. For instance, international telephone calls have gone up enormously since the late 1990s. Uh, Communication technology has improved, the rates are cheaper, and so forth. Um, the people simply stay in, in touch uh, by telephone. The number of international travelers leaving U.S. airports or arriving at U.S. airports uh, has also increased. Um, to give you a number, in 1975, there were 10 million such uh, air passengers. In 2000, there were 60 million such passengers. Um, and then once again from our survey, we, we asked active churchgoers about some of their activities that might have exposed them to other countries. Well, 62% had traveled or lived in another country. 14% had actually lived in another country for at least a year. Uh, more than 4 in 10 said they have friends or relatives who live outside of the United States. 11% um, have served in the armed forces. Uh, church members who are currently working, uh, of those, 37% said that they routinely interact with people at work uh, from other countries. And then immigration is another uh, very important factor. The U.S. has been historically a nation of immigrants, but since the immigration laws were changed in 1965, Something like 22 million legal immigrants have come to the United States, and as many as 7 to 10 million undocumented people have arrived in this country. Uh, that has had a special impact on certain demographic groups. For instance, in 1970, only 4% of young men, that is males in their 20s, only 4% were immigrants. By 2018%, or almost one in five, were immigrants. So that's a demographic that's been affected a lot. Um, we asked people in our survey uh, about this. 8% said that they were the uh, recent immigrants themselves, presumably first generation. Another 14% said they were children of recent immigrants. And 74% said they attended congregations in which some immigrants were present. So of course that presence of immigrants from some other country in your church is really a very important way in which some of the short-term or long-term uh, mission activities happen. So communication is one source. 
A second source is the growing number of congregations in other countries to partner with. This is where the new paradigm people get it right. Those congregations in other countries have proliferated, especially in Africa and Latin America and in some East Asian, South Asian countries. Um, it's hard to exactly find uh, good numbers. Uh, David Barrett's group has put together some such numbers, but even from those numbers, which are probably an underestimated, uh, uh, the number of churches in a lot of those other countries in Africa, Latin America, and so forth, has either doubled or tripled uh, over the past 20 years or so. That simply makes it easier to go in and be a partner with another congregation. We also know that international non-governmental organizations of other kinds, INGOs, uh, have increased uh, so much so that in some communities, some capital cities, especially in Africa and Latin America, there are almost too many non-governmental organizations to almost stumble uh, over the number that are there. Uh, the other thing that has been a part of this kind of easing of the ability to do work in other countries is the fact that English as either a first language or a second language has uh, spread. The best estimates are that as a first language, English is only the first language of about 370 mil 75 million people around the world. It's a good second language for another 375 million and then the estimate is that probably that many, again, that is another 750 million are fluent enough in English that they can communicate fairly well with an native English speaker. So that's important. The third factor is the sheer preponderance of resources of American churches. Christianity in the United States is not the religion of the downtrodden. It's a religion of everybody. It's a religion of the middle class. Um, if you look at the average incomes of church members, the average incomes are about the same as for everybody else, and those have been going up, taking aside the last couple of years, those have gone up steadily over the past 30 years. So even if the average church member only gives 1% or possibly 2% of his or her income to the church or to any charitable organization, that adds up. It's a lot of funding. And if you compare the amount of funding that U.S. churches can raise just because we're a rich country with what a lot of other people in other countries can raise, it, it does add up. Another uh, another source is the megachurch. This, I think, is an important factor because megachurches, on the one hand, are growing. They still only make up, as far as we can tell, surveys, they only make up about 2% of congregations, but they make up about 16% of church members. And that is, if you define a megachurch fairly loosely with anybody over 2,000 members in their congregation. That's not the will of reason, and so forth. Um, but those numbers seem to be growing. But the other thing is that many churches have the resources simply to do whatever they want to do locally, that is to organize activities uh, through their church, rather than having to go through a denomination or through a mission board of some kind. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, some of our interviews at Willow Creek, uh, and some of the people we talked to told us the story about the first time back in, I believe it was the early 1990s, that they said, we should take up a special offering for international missions. And so they did, and they took up an offering of $2 million. <laughs> and so they thought, well, we can do this, and so they've been doing it uh, ever since. They can do that. Um, another example uh, was a non-denominational church uh, we studied in California that had a membership of 12,000 people, and it provided a 
and a nice illustration not just of the money, but how these things are organized. That congregation provides partial support, at least, for 27 or 28 missionary families, full-time missionaries, in 20 different countries. And they, like a lot of mega churches, have cell groups, and so the cell groups are divided up to support, or pray for, or communicate with each of those families. And then there's a global missions director who works through the local groups, often with short-term volunteers, to identify people who might be good as long-term professional missionaries. Trains them, nurtures them, mentors them. And then that global missions director also spends a lot of time traveling around, staying in touch with the 27 or 28 missionary families. So it's a very integral part of the congregation. People know about their missionaries, they have photos, they send emails, they pray for them, and so it isn't just a tacked on experience. A fifth source of globalization is what I would term the saturation effect. And what I mean by that is that some of the denominations that were growing the most back in the 1970s, back when Dean Kelly wrote his famous book, Why Conservative Churches Are Growing. Some of those churches, for instance, the Southern Baptist Convention, which I mentioned a moment ago, hasn't really been growing that much in the last decade or decade and a half. Uh, for instance, in the 1970s, the Southern Baptist Convention was growing annually by 2.3%. And since 1996, it's been growing by 0.6%. Another example is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. It was growing very rapidly in the 1970s, and in recent years, it's been growing at a rate of 0.4% a year. And the Assemblies of God were growing at an astounding 9.2% in the 1970s, and more recently, growing 1.8% a year. So with declining growth, with a kind of saturation happening within the United States, a lot of the resources are being placed in overseas mission activities. Southern Baptist Convention, for instance, since the early 70s has grown in membership by about a third, but it has more than doubled its foreign missionary staff. Okay, the last thing I want to talk about just briefly are some of the challenges, and then we'll stop and have your questions. So what are some of the challenges that religious leaders face as they think ahead about all of these different international ministries? Well, one certainly is this issue of balancing the local and the global. It's difficult to achieve that balance. Every congregation has to figure out how it's going to do it itself. But one of the things, if you look at the history of all kinds of missionary activities, one of the things that really strikes you is that it has always taken formal organization, formal boards of some kind, whether they're denominational boards, independent boards, parachurch organizations, to keep things going. Because if you just kind of leave it to the motivation of individuals in the congregation, they're not always going to be able to sustain that activity. Especially when challenges come and the roof blows off and they have to focus on that. And so forth. The second challenge is this one that we're all familiar with, a balancing evangelism and service. And this is one that I think some of the large organizations have done fairly well. Um, the more I learned about World Vision, the more I thought they had done a pretty good job at achieving that delicate balance. Uh, in other cases, people sometimes try to wish it away by simply saying that service is evangelism. Um, but what's new about all of this, or fairly new, the last 30 years or so, is that an increasing share of the funding for international ministries comes from the U.S. government. World Vision, World Relief, Catholic Relief Services get a lot of their funding from USAID. 
whether it's food relief, emergency relief, health relief, whatever it may be. And surprisingly, especially in view of the tremendous flack that the first Clinton and then the Bush administration faith-based initiative got for domestic faith-based charitable activities, hardly any attention has been focused on these international activities. But it is a big issue, and, and so when you talk to people in Catholic Relief Services or World Vision or World Relief, they've had to be very careful in figuring out that balance, figuring out what they feel they can do as a humanitarian effort, and then do that in a way that doesn't compromise their Christian witness. So that's going to be a continuing challenge, it seems to me. Another challenge is dealing with the historical legacy of Christian efforts overseas. A legacy that many people, even who are very actively involved in international ministries, are ambivalent about. Because on the one hand, you have the gripping stories of martyrs, even of extreme sacrifice, heroic missionary activities. And on the other hand, you have the ugly American who bumbles along and takes a lot of Americanism uh, into another context where it shouldn't be taken or it just doesn't apply. And that was something when we when we talked to the heads of the large agencies, they were often very concerned about. And a lot of them, frankly, were not too keen on short-term mission activities because it was the short-termers who were coming in all gun ho you know, saying, we can plant corn like we do in Iowa, and that's going to help you out. Or we can run your hospital like we do in New Jersey, and that's going to work. And the people who've been there for a while uh, knew better and sometimes had to push back. On that. Finally, there's the challenge of trying to be the conscience of America in the world. That is, trying to be people of faith who are guided by their faith, who have their faith as an internal moral compass, and who are attempting to be a witness for that faith, often in the midst of U.S. foreign policies that they may not agree with, wars that they may not agree with, or humanitarian efforts that they think are ill-founded, or aid and development that isn't being efficiently administered. All of those terrible difficulties that people face, and especially in an era of terrorism, uh, in an era when the dispersion of weapons, uh, large and small, pose dangers and evoke fears, question is there, what does one do? Uh, how does one deal with the issue of military expenditures or wars? And then especially as the U.S. economy is in its current slump, and maybe for a while, uh, what does that imply? It's going to be easier for the average church who was sending people to say, huh? Ah, we just can't afford it this year, maybe not next year either. We're going to have to scale back. We're going to hope that things aren't as bad in some other part of the world, but we know that's probably not the case. If things are bad here, they're probably even worse in a lot of other, especially underdeveloped parts of the world. So if American Christians were to cut back, if we would just imagine somehow by magic, all of these activities, long-term and short-term, that I've been talking about are going to disappear, Things would be quite different. And I'd be very sure that the European Union isn't going to pick it up, Japan's not going to pick it up, and China's not going to pick it up. So that's a challenge. That's one of the challenges. All right, thank you.
both of them. Um, the, the issue about the global church, do I need to talk about that or has that been around the last few days? I'll talk about it. Okay. So this is, this is a really nice idea that in, instead of the dominant trend that we see, let's say, in politics and in economic circles, markets over being globalization, what's happening is globalization. And that's what you're referring to, right? Okay. It's, uh, I'd actually talk about it some in my book. It was talked about uh, by a sociologist of religion named Roland Robertson, who apparently picked it up from some Japanese sources. It's been around for a while, but it's a, it's a nice idea because it says, Okay, no matter where you go in the world and look at a local church, or for that matter, probably a local business, taxi driver, taxi stand, whatever, it may seem very local because there are the, there's the imprint of the local culture, the language, the ways in which a neighborhood is configured, the way in which people, let's see, church have learned to worship in their language and brought in their traditions into it. But it is also influenced by these broader global connections that we've been talking about. It's been influenced, for instance, by videotapes or by television. It's been influenced by televangelists. It's been influenced by the fact that the people in that congregation are working for international companies or their livelihood is dependent on international companies. So what that suggests is that on the one hand, the argument that, which is out, which is out there, it's in Tom Friedman's books and others who write about globalization, the argument that everything becomes more the same, that globalization creates a kind of monoculture, just misses a lot of things. There is still that local texture. And at the same time, it's a strong argument against the more extreme conversion of the new paradigm that, that I was talking about. And I said, no, no, it's, it's all just local. So what that means is that it is very important to understand in any specific context how those things are coming in. And it, and it means you can't paint with a broad brush. You can't provide a kind of single answer to, well, what is the answer to the globalized church? The challenge, to bring it back to short-term missions, is that any short-term mission team that's going into one of those local churches or local schools needs to understand both the local context and the ways in which the external world is influence, influencing it. Um, my church, Presbyterian Church in Princeton, experienced this in a kind of sad way. It has been going to a place in Guatemala for several years now, maybe 10 years now. And one of the first times, it's, it spent a huge amount of preparation working up health screening packets. And they had a doctor, maybe several doctors on, on the team. They spent a lot of time doing it. They weren't aware that the World Health Organization was coming through the same village two weeks before to do exactly the same thing. So they needed to kind of look beyond the congregation itself and increasingly they did that. Your second question is, or comment is a good one too. Are we providing service but not in Jesus' name? And that's the, that's the real issue that uh, any organization, whether it's a church or parachurch organization, that says we are a Christian organization, we want to be spreading the good news of Christ. How do we do that if we never mention the name of, of Jesus? And it becomes very tricky for these organizations that are accepting a lot of government money or maybe working with a lot of secular organizations. Or increasingly, they're working with other religious organizations, other world religious organizations. How do they do that? It's not impossible, and I've, I've seen in the conversations I've had during this, this project, a lot of good examples where people were saying, yeah, we're, we're still 
saying that we're a Christian organization. We're still saying that in our mission statement. We're still talking to people. We're saying we're bringing this, whatever it is, to you in the name of Jesus. But trying to do it in the spirit of the gospel, which they understand is a spirit of love, rather than beating somebody over the head or simply saying, okay, you've got to convert before we give you any of the goodies that we have at our disposal. But you're right, it's an absolutely important consideration. Yes? Yeah, just to uh, follow on that, I'm doing some research on this balancing of evangelism and service. Um, and especially with the younger generation, um, growing commitment to service and justice, more struggle to figure out how in the midst of that commitment and growing concern to articulate faith um, effectively. And I'm looking at, I'm doing a project with Willow Creek uh, with uh, about priests, and then I'm also looking at some of the emerging missional movements, emerging churches, and so forth. So I just would like to ask your advice as a very accomplished researcher. Um, where do you think some of the best research that you've done on this issue that could maybe help the church the most? Where the best research could be done? Yeah. Or is being done? Yeah. yeah. Well, the research I've, I've seen hasn't actually been research. I guess I'm thinking more about people who I've heard speak. And so maybe it does fall more into the research that could be done. It's, it's been with people who have, either in this country or in other countries, been working across the lines with, between Christians and other world religious groups. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of one conversation uh, we had at Princeton with a person who had been actually doing a lot of work in Nigeria, across the Christians in the South, Muslims in the North. Um, and so the, the research question really was a descriptive question. Well, how in a context like that do you present yourself as a Christian uh, without um, without doing it in a way that seems to trump the other religion or best the other religion. Um, remember this one person we were talking to had just been doing amazing humanitarian relief activities uh, with Muslim villages, uh, bringing in food and so forth. As near as I could tell, as he described it, there was nothing being said about this being Christian or him being Christian. And so I asked him about it, and he, and he declared that, oh, absolutely, that was his motivation. So I said, well, what do you say? He said, well, I say that I'm trying to be a follower of Christ. And, and leave it at that. And that seemed to be a rubric that was coming up a number of times. Um, kind of focusing a bit on the mystery of God. And that old adage from the early church fathers that what we know about God is what we don't know about God. Um, and so therefore, not immediately by any means, going into the argument that, well, all religions are really the same, but saying there's a lot about mine that I don't understand yet, and I'm trying to be as faithful to mine as I can. So I think any context where you could find people like that, as I say, working in other countries or working in this country, I think that would, that would be rich. Yes, sorry. Have you uh, related what you believe is the narrative of the new paradigm? I'd like you to hear you uh, describe the narrative of the new new paradigm. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, well, the narrative would uh, would really focus on, and I could probably do it in propositional form more, e more easily than as a kind of compelling narrative at, at this point, but it would, it would say, yes, there are more Christians in the global south, whatever the global south is, 
But there are many vibrant churches still in the global north, especially in the United States. And those churches are quite rich in resources compared with much of the rest of the world. And there are many American Christians who are eager to serve and be part of that global interaction with Christians or with other people around the world. And so as a result of that, what we see are increasing numbers of people in all kinds of churches and parent church ministries engaging in global ministries and feeling that that is important because of the shrinkage of the globe and because of the Christian mandate. I think it would be as simple as that. <coughs> I work for one of these agencies, and I'm seeing our role in the church shift. I've been there since 96, and I've seen it just before, working with them, and seeing our role shift. And I see our role becoming more and more facilitating the whole church and mission, and being uh, one that helps frame the mission and helps uh, 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 call partners together around could you talk a little bit more about you said it's going to come and go, but we're always going to need these agencies more. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm sure from our brief conversation earlier, I'm, I'm sure we, we talked to some of the people with, at your agency or who were doing similar things and, and at other denominational agencies. And I'm convinced that, and, and, and what convinced me was actually going back to the beginning of foreign mission activity in the United States, going back to the period around 1811, 1812, when Judson's first went out. And looking at the changes that were taking place as denominational efforts grew and then independent organizations grew at the end of the 19th century and more recently then NGOs in the, in the 20th century. And being struck by two things, one is that there were actually a lot of things that they invented a long time ago that we're still using. I've, I've just been very impressed with the American Board of Commissioners for Foreign Missions. They invented a lot of ways of raising money, keeping missionaries accountable, and so forth. Many of those things have, have continued so that we don't have to reinvent the wheel, and we shouldn't assume that just because we can all get together by email or on the internet now that everything has, has to be different, a lot of continuity. And then secondly, that one of those continuities has been having a centralized staff, whether it's centralized in a denomination or cross denominations, whatever it might be, having people whose job it is as professionals to keep their eye on the ball and say, you know, what are the changes going on? What are, what are the challenges? Maybe we've been investing a little bit too heavily in something we need to pull back. Maybe we've been missing a dime over here. Working, in a way, protected a little bit from the person in the queue. There's some sociological literature on, on the importance of some degree of bureaucratic insulation, as a matter of fact. So you can sift through some of these thorny issues, maybe eventually it becomes something that the General Convention or the General Assembly votes on, but more likely it's something that is happening with people like you and your counterparts, and it's happening in a lot of innovative ways, you know, through developing networks, through working with lay people as well as clergy, through having conferences, bringing people from other countries here, sending people here, there. Um, that's the kind of ongoing activity that is needed. And we also know that that doesn't just happen either because you know, there can be a big budget crunch, denomination can lose members, lose finances, you know, suddenly half the people in an office like yours are gone. So, you know, we also need to kind of keep the PR going uh, so that the support is there for those ongoing activities. <coughs> 
the culture and I do have some misgivings about uh, the, the downside. Um, I, was, uh, I was talking to somebody who was writing a, an article for a church periodical about this recently and, and a similar question came up and, and we got to amusing about the, what especially youth groups or maybe college groups, groups, high school groups we were, we were thinking about. So what's, what's different now, well, it used to be that you'd get your high school youth group together and you'd say, why don't you go spend a week in Harlan, Kentucky? Uh, help those poor people in Appalachia. Now we say, yeah, it's just as cheap to get on a plane and go to the Dominican Republic. So spend a week in the Dominican Republic. And it probably is just as cheap, and it's a whole lot more fun for them than spending a week in Harlan, Kentucky. It's a kind of sexy thing to say, hey, I've been Costa Rica, or I've been to Ghana, or wherever. And so there's that, that kind of tourist aspect of it that is part of the culture, and then you connect that with the volunteering, which may have kind of a better side to it, where people are saying, well, yeah, I'd like to help out. Maybe those people in Harlem, Kentucky have been helped out so much they don't need it as much as the people in the Dominican Republic. So we'll be good volunteers there. But the difficulty with volunteering is that it takes somebody's time. It isn't just free money, so to speak. It takes somebody to lead and organize and supervise and administer the volunteers. And that's a heavy enough load on itself. But it's also a load on the host send a troop of volunteers into a poor community in Guatemala, and they've got to deal with these people, maybe a whole bunch of them over the course of a, of a summer. And so, you know, maybe in the long run, they're glad to have the volunteers, but on the other hand, it's cost a lot for the host communities too. So that's, that's just part of the downside. Anybody over on this side? Okay, one more thing here. I'd like to know if there's any research being done on those high schoolers doing uh, short-term mission domestically. Um, is, there, is there anyone doing research on the numbers? Um, because I, I, in my own experience, I know there are some who are saying, yeah, it's cheaper to go to the Dominican Republic, but there, I don't see that they're leaving one for the other. So I'm right. wondering, is there a way of comparing? I, yeah, I, I see. No, I, I, I think you're quite right to raise that question, and I, I may be completely off track in saying that there's a, a trade-off. Um, I believe, I don't, I haven't looked at this closely enough to know for sure. Um, Steve, maybe, maybe you know. In the new National Congregations survey, is there a question about any kind of short term, um, or maybe some of Mark Breitner's work. Yeah, yeah. So we we think there there may Mark Breitner at University of Texas has I think his article's been published and I think maybe it includes both domestic and international, but I'm not completely sure. Maybe some of the rest of you I I know some of you have been doing more in depth research. Big surveys, so there may be. That's that's about the extent of what I know about the research. I, I like the the new new paradigm, paradigm you're calling us to. I'm struggling with part of the implications. So if you have Christians coming from resource-rich portions of the world, going to places where there are also Christian churches and so on. Part of um, what I'm saying is what the good is is being contributed to the, the, the short-termers 
and everything has been really good to hear those. I just have a question regarding when you mentioned um, the Church of Latter-day, Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, basically the Mormon Church. How, how in your signing that, I was wondering how are you viewing that? Are you, you know, just in your mind, you know, I just wanted to have some clarification as to that um, church being mentioned. Well, I'm, I'm viewing it as a church that, as you know, has poured enormous uh, amounts of energy in, into their required two-year service uh, activities. And what I've, what I've read, uh, we did not include the Mormon church in, in our study. Um, if it's possible, I don't remember, there may have been a few respondents in the survey, but we, we didn't, we, we focused on churches that really claim to be kind of mainstream evangelical Catholic churches and so forth. Been enough studies of the Mormon church in other ways that we didn't think we needed to replicate those. My understanding from reading some of those studies is that they've run into some difficulties getting enough of, of their young people to volunteer for these two-year mission trips. Um, and they've they haven't been able to 
uh, levy some of the sanctions, you know, about having done that in order to get married in one of the temples and so forth. That's weakened a little bit. And so they've begun, in some instances, I don't know how widespread this is, to also turn more to the short term, to the one week, the, the two week uh, activity uh, as opposed to that. But that's, that's the extent of my knowledge of it. Good yeah. question. Yeah, I just, I, I just wanted to ask that because because I, I do think it's an important distinction to make. Yeah. And um, I just think of Galatians 1, 6 through 9, and just that warning about if anyone's preaching the gospel other right. than what you've been told and that type of thing, um, what is biblical, then, you know, just wanted to draw the lines and know, okay. you know, where things stood with that. So, All right. yeah. Thank you. Yep. Most of the discussions regarding short-term missions involve the Resource North facilitating ministries in the South. Um, I work with an organization that has a long history in Japan, which is itself resource rich. We have a hard time recruiting short-term teams to go into Japan. You speak that from a sociological perspective. Are there implications there that beyond just the fact that it's not sexy to go to Japan? Yeah. <laughs> Well, it was, sexy, it was sexy to go to Japan a few years ago when Japan was China in terms of the <laughs> world economy and everybody thought it was, it was the wave of the future. Not necessarily sexy to go as, as a short or long-term missionary, but uh, as a volunteer, as, as a teacher, uh, a very attractive place for American graduate students to go and teach English for, for a while in, in Japan. and. In some of those instances, they were being missionaries on, on the side, even though they were, they were, they were teaching English. Um, so I don't, I don't know right now if it's because the kind of sexy parts of the world has just kind of shifted. So if you were thinking about going from here to someplace in East Asia, you'd immediately think of going to China instead of Japan, or if, or if there's something more to that, but you're right, it's an interesting phenomenon, and I, you probably have some ob observations of your own. <laughs> no? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, I mean, I do. You had mentioned Curry when you were speaking about missional emphasis being a factor of the church being involved in the world, and there are other things as well. And I was just wondering if you have know, the research that There is some research going on. I, I don't recall at the moment whether Daryl's team is involved with that or, or it's another group that I, I heard about. Um, somebody was doing some research and writing some, uh, a book kind of, of best practices as, as to how churches are, are putting that in, uh, into operation. I, yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think you're right. Yeah. And so that's that's really the only thing I've heard of in, in terms of research. My own concern a, a little bit was that the, the Gutier formulation um, seemed to be a little bit one size fits all, uh, or maybe you know maybe, maybe a little bit. Well, you know, we'll just start calling whatever we do missional. And it didn't necessarily suggest that we need a new direction, but I could be totally critical. Yeah, wait a minute. This may be slightly outside the realm of the discussion, but can you say something to the extent to which you um, see short-term missions and explosions thereof uh, kind of affecting a recalibration in the mind of more long-term minded people about what long-term is? I mean, I've heard the stat that the, the average long-term career is now eight years. Do you think that that's uh, directly related to short-term explosion, or do you think it's um, that is given rise to by the same factors which lead to the short-term explosion itself, just the increase in the things that you mentioned about communication, English, and so on? I, yeah, I, I think it's more the latter. I, I didn't, I didn't see any evidence that people were saying, oh, well, this is the short-term model, and therefore we should recalibrate the long-term model to go along with it. Now I may have just missed it because I wasn't specifically looking for it, but I did see a lot of. Uh, 
evidence of the other dynamic that, that you're talking about where, where people were saying, well, if you're a long-term missionary, it's probably going to be easier and cheaper to get home more often. You can keep in contact with, with people uh, easier. You may also feel greater responsibility under the kind of current educational culture and so forth that may have been true several generations ago, at least toward your children. You want them to be in the U.S. for college, or maybe you want, as a parent, you want to be in the U.S. at a certain time, maybe when your children are being born, or for safety reasons, you know, whatever it may be. And the other thing that probably doesn't have anything directly to do with globalization, um, probably has more to do with longevity, is that you have people doing second and third careers. Um, you know, so in some denominations, the average age of going into parish clergy is mid-40s. And you can easily imagine then that some, somebody who says, you know, okay, I've, I've retired at 60 or 62 and I'm healthy. Uh, I want to go be a long-term volunteer maybe long term in that case means five years or eight years or ten years. So that, that would be part of the yeah. 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 When I read your book, I found you uh, mentioned about immigrant law, immigration law and immigrant churches pastor. I wonder uh, do immigrant churches uh, also uh, contribute to this uh, uh, global ministry? Have you ever researched uh, yeah, the, the short answer is yes, immigrant churches and, and clergy and immigrant churches do contribute to uh, global ministries in a couple of ways. Uh, one, where, uh, where one hears, as even in the new paradigm, the discussion focuses on the number of immigrants, let's say, from the global south to the U.S. who are missionaries or, or clergy. That's absolutely true, and it tends to be, from what we can tell at this point, it tends to be people who are ministering in immigrant congregations, for the most part, especially among Protestants. Now, among Catholics, with the priest shortage, especially in rural parishes, they have relied on international priests, especially from Africa and India, to fill some of those slots in the U.S. So that's that's a little bit different dynamic. In some instances, it's working pretty well. Some of it hasn't worked so well. And then you also have the, the other direction, where someone is an immigrant in the U.S., maybe still with family in the original country, and so besides maybe sending remittances back, there's also a fair amount of transnationalism going on. It's, it's been studied, some Peggy Levitt's books talk, talk about this. So that the ties are continuing maybe in a way that wasn't true 100 years ago with that wave of immigration. And that may make it easier for somebody who's an immigrant in this country, who's gotten educated in the U.S., has gotten some training maybe in a U.S. church to say at some point, yeah, you know, either I personally want to go back to the country I came from or I want to help others go back and maintain those connections. How are we doing on time? Uh, when he was doing his research, 
it showed that uh, those short termers who were there, those they spent so much money to build houses. In the terms of actual influence or impact, it was minimal. And if you look on the theoretical level, uh, when we had uh, this controversy uh, in the Anglican Church about uh, uh, adulation of uh, bishop, and uh, though the Americans had all the influence, global influence, but yet the majority world stood on the theoretical ground and they say no. So, in terms of influence, as uh, you categorize it, what kind of influence are you talking about? Uh, which dimension are you giving it in your book? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. Uh, I tend to think that the influence, insofar as we could measure it, and I made no effort to measure it at all, I, I think it's very difficult to do, but let's just make some, some guesses. I think the influence of American short-termers or even some of the other you know, long-term dimensions I've talked about is really pretty small. It's small in two ways. One, it goes back to the issue of the local church. So a great deal of what's going on in, in a local community really is still local and distinctly local, even though you have the occasional construction team coming in and putting on a, on a roof and then they disappear. Everything else is still happening year-round on a, on a local basis. So it's, it's a small influence relative to that. It's probably also a small influence relative to what the U.S.'s influence is in other ways in the world. One of the kind of skeptical responses I've gotten from the book or talking to people as I was working on the book is from people who are completely unfamiliar with the religious landscape. And you try out these numbers, well, there's several billion dollars being spent here and there, and several million people doing this and that, and they say, yeah, but the US government you know, is spending trillions of dollars, and they've got a military that's doing this, that, and the other thing. And they can shape trade issues, and you know, everything else that they'll argue is determined much more by politics and economics than any of this. Is that right? Probably it is. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of dollars and cents or, or numbers of people have a bunch of well-meaning Christians going on short-term mission trips, and that changes the dynamic a little bit. But if what people are mostly either experiencing in their home town, or if not in their hometown, on CNN, is all sorts of violence and corruption and military excursions and trade deals and rich people getting richer, are they going to be influenced by very much by what they see? The question that got me interested in this whole project was sitting in my church during the adult Sunday school classes and saying to myself, okay, are, are we, those of us who are, are not out there around the world doing things, are those of us who are just sitting here in New Jersey, are we understanding what we see on CNN any differently than the person who's not sitting here? Is there anything that's kind of being filtered through because we hear somebody who's seen it firsthand and not just on TV or somebody who's got a different angle on it, somebody who's giving that side rather than the dominant side of the story? And the answer to that question is for the most part, no. No. Active churchgoers are not viewing the world very differently from anybody else who's watching it through CNN. 
but there are exceptions. And the exceptions are these 20 to 25% of churches that are heavily involved in transcultural missionary activities. Because they're the, they're the churches where they've not only spent some time and money sending short-termers or supporting long-termers, they've also had some guest speakers from other countries and they've had some discussions where they've been talking about these larger foreign policy issues perhaps. And they may not be a voice that's strong enough to then march to Washington and say, you ought to do anything differently than, than you're doing. But they are thinking about these issues, and a lot of times they're thinking about them differently. They may be thinking, ah, eh, you know, U.S. military policy isn't exactly right, or U.S. foreign aid isn't as good as it ought to be. So those, those are still small, but I think if we're looking for some signs of hope, there are some. Thank you.